Good evening, Tributes, and welcome back to Tales of the Hunger Games. I hope that everyone is groovy and that you've had an outstanding week wherever you are. This week, going to be doing it slightly differently. I will be writing, but I am also joined by my co-writer, the marvellous Laura McCouch. We're each going to be writing part of these games, so you can try and guess who might be writing each bit. But as usual, we're also joined by the fabulous Andrew McLean, who will be providing all the art for this episode. A further shout out to my Patreons as well for their financial pledge to me every month it is really appreciated. And also I'd like to mention the Hunger Games Discord, where games are created based on your decisions. Find the link for that in the description, along with plenty of other links that are based on this series. So without further ado, andiamo. The 94th games took place in the year 106. Early in the morning of the final day of the reapings, last year's victor, Sandy Selleck, arrived in District 6. Whilst waiting on the platform and speaking to Mayor Gunner and the other officials, she appeared to be watching the youths from the corner of her eye, who were being sorted into the appropriate spaces in their enclosures. Many of these black-clad creatures were clearly feeling the morning after-effects of their depraved parties, and some were apparently still under the influence of whatever substances they had taken, which was most likely morphling in this district. A brief speech was made by the mayor, during which a few youths passed out and were simply left to lie on the ground, where they would at least be quiet. Sandy appeared to be in shock at these surreal events, until she was finally prompted to choose a name for the female reaping bowl. She then marched forwards and picked up a piece of paper, which she read out to be that of 17-year-old Marilyn Hanks. An unusual silence followed these words, and whilst the camera was busy finding Maryland within the group of 17-year-old girls, Eugenia Ravenstill commented that the population all looked dead behind the eyes. A few seconds later, the camera finally zoomed in on a pale young lady with sagging eyes and lank black hair. However, Marilyn did not seem to even acknowledge what had happened, and it was only when a peacekeeper marched over and jogged her back with his gun that she looked around in a daze. Whilst Ennius Dalton commented that someone had a big night, Marilyn was slowly pulled forwards by the peacekeepers, hardly reacting until she was in the aisle, at which point she finally appeared to realise the gravity of the situation, before letting out a pathetic wail. In fact, she pushed against the peacekeepers with such force that as they pulled her onto the platform, her grubby black dress ripped along the arm. Marilyn then burst into tears, and had to be practically held in place by peacekeepers to stop her from flailing around any more. Mayor Gunner then nodded towards the male reaping bowl, and Sandy slowly approached, while Eugenia was heard to say that Maryland should make good television at least, and Ennius asked if she had crawled directly out of the sewers. Seconds later, Sandy thrust her hand into the bowl, before picking out a name and reading it to be that of 17-year-old Delaware Vost. The camera soon panned in on another grim creature, although this one was even paler, with dirty brown hair and an unkempt beard. However, as the peacekeeper approached Delaware, he suddenly stumbled into the aisle and fell to the ground, before gagging in an apparent shock, which caused the camera to quickly shift its focus to the reactions of his peers, which were mainly that of indifference. The peacekeeper soon picked Delaware up from the dirty ground, and his black suit was now covered in even more stains. He was practically dragged towards the platform, whilst Marilyn was whimpering and looking like she was about to pass out. As Delaware walked up the steps, he tripped and almost fell back to the ground below, but luckily, the peacekeeper had escorted him up the stairs and was able to grab onto his arm. Delaware then shook hands with Sandy, who rescinded her hand as quickly as she could. He proceeded to take out a flask from his jacket pocket, but the peacekeepers jumped in to take it from him. Mayor Gunner quickly dismissed the population of the district, probably in order to avoid any further embarrassment, and as he escorted Sandy and the tributes into the town hall, Ennius said that he would be amazed if either of them made it beyond the first day of the games. Marilyn was soon visited by her older sister, Baltimore, and the peacekeepers present later stated that it was one of the quietest meetings that they had ever witnessed. The girls seemed to share some quiet and pitiful words with each other, although neither expressed much emotion, and it was clear that Baltimore was also still under the influence. However, as the sisters had a final embrace, it was later seen that Baltimore had snuck a pack of morphling tablets into one of Marilyn's side dress pockets. As for Delaware, he was met by his parents. Although neither of them appear to be under the influence, his mother wept so loudly that whatever she was saying was incomprehensible. 
Delaware's father tried to advise him on what he should do before the games, but Delaware seemed to have re-entered his earlier trance, and was therefore unlikely to have paid attention to what his father said. Both tributes were subsequently placed on the train by the peacekeepers, who understandably left them alone as quickly as they could. The journey began, and the AVOX present later stated that Delaware tried speaking to Maryland, and although she replied to some of his questions and comments, she did not generate much conversation herself, and soon fell asleep. Delaware appeared to become bored, and he began to pace around the carriage while scratching himself intensely, and occasionally looking at a book or artifact on the wall, then going back to pacing and scratching in a rather tedious pattern. Yet he quickly stopped and looked in surprise as he and Marilyn's mentor, Madison Hawker, victor of the 85th Hunger Games, suddenly entered the carriage. As Marilyn perked up, Madison told the pair that she was not very impressed by what she had seen from them during the reapings, and so therefore she doubted that the capital citizens would be either. Madison then sat down at the dining table next to Marilyn, and she ordered Delaware to join her, but he simply looked at her in disbelief, which prompted her to repeat this instruction louder, although this only caused Marilyn to wince with fatigue and turn over, before apparently trying to sleep again. Madison was clearly stunned by how uncooperative her attributes were already acting, but she simply breathed out, before calmly stating that she was their mentor, and that she wanted to speak to them about the upcoming week before they reached the capital, which would require them to both be awake and sitting at the table with her. Delaware hesitated before joining her, but Marilyn simply muttered that she wanted to sleep and that she did not care before closing her eyes. Yet as Delaware sat down, Madison poured a glass of water before throwing its contents at Marilyn. This made her gasp in shock as she felt her now drenched hair and Madison quickly pressed the button to summon the peacekeepers. Whilst Marilyn looked like she was about to get up and attack Madison, the peacekeepers entered. Madison then looked at Marilyn, who was now scowling, before calmly asking if they were ready to begin. Madison started her briefing by explaining how important the station greetings were, and that they should be willing to take pictures with capital citizens, but just as she began to explain the fittings for the parade, Marilyn stated that she needed to use the toilet, and Madison begrudgingly excused her. As Marilyn left, Madison asked Delaware if he had any questions so far, but he simply shook his head and continued to look out the window at the passing forests. A few minutes later, the train passed a large rock in a field, which appeared to have a strange language written upon its side. Madison asked one of the peacekeepers what was said on this rock, and they soon engaged in conversation, during which time Delaware asked if he could also use the toilet, and Madison uncaringly accepted this request. Yet after a few minutes had passed, she began to wonder where her tributes were. After marching to the end of the train with the peacekeeper, Madison heard giggling and loud breathing coming from the toilet, but instead of knocking on the door, she simply nodded to the peacekeeper who jammed his gun against the lock and the door swung open. Madison was enraged to see Delaware about to put a morphling tablet on his tongue, whilst Marilyn held a batch in her hands, and upon a further investigation, it was revealed that these tablets were given to Marilyn by her sister. The corridor cameras showed Madison's eyes widen in anger before she grabbed Marilyn by her hair and pulled her to the ground, whilst the peacekeeper took the tablet from Delaware and threw it down the toilet. Madison proceeded to shout at Marilyn that these tablets were pure trash, before forcing them from Marilyn's grip and throwing them into the toilet. Marilyn howled in indignation, and Madison pinned her to the ground by her neck before checking all her pockets. When Madison found the bag that had the remaining tablets, she swiftly threw it down the toilet as well before flushing it away, which triggered screams of anger and sorrow from Marilyn. Madison then got up and yelled at her tributes that she was trying to help them survive these games, and that this stuff had caused her to end up in the games in the first place. As Madison continued her outburst, Marilyn seemed more upset about the fact that her morphling had been destroyed. Madison concluded by asking if the pair really did not care about ever seeing their families again, but that if they cared one little bit, then they should listen to her advice. It was noted that once Madison had stopped shouting at her tributes, Delaware appeared somewhat affected by what she had just said. For the rest of the afternoon, Madison insisted that they return to the main carriage, where the peacekeepers kept watch over the tributes every move. She continued explaining what would happen over the upcoming week, and although Marilyn's ostentatious yawning made Madison's efforts seem futile, Delaware at least appeared to be paying attention. Indeed, as the train neared Snow Station, he made the simple effort of asking Madison if he looked smart enough for the pictures that the capital citizens would be about to take of him. 
Madison looked down at his dirty suit and grimaced slightly, before replying that he did not look smart, but that if he were friendly enough, this would not matter. Madison's advice appeared effective, and although many citizens seemed hesitant about letting their smart clothes brush against the dirty stains all over Delaware's, they generally appeared quite taken by his smile and charisma that had so far not been shown. Some citizens asked if Delaware's eyes were all right, likely due to the size of his pupils, but he simply replied that he felt fine, and Madison appeared pleased to watch him interacting with the capital's citizens. As for Maryland, she seemed rather shy, but not overtly rude, although the camera flashes seemed to leave her so dazed and apparently dizzy that she almost fell to the ground behind her. However, Madison quickly stepped in to support Maryland by the arm, and she rather cunningly managed to divert attention away by pointing at a rolling billboard that was advertising the upcoming film about the life of Bluebell Jansen, victor of the 21st games, called Lex 11. The group were soon taken to their apartment in the accommodation building, where Madison allowed her tributes a few minutes to look around and marvel at the fine designs. She then called them back to the main room and put on the screen to Capital TV, where Eugenia and Ennius were discussing the chances of the 24 tributes that had been reaped so far. As Delaware and Maryland glanced at their opponents on screen, Madison made the telephone call for the group's stylist, Valentino Phipps. Valentino soon arrived and introduced himself to the tributes, although he immediately seemed somewhat repulsed by the mere sight of them. He then ordered his team to take their vital measurements, and this was done without much incident, although it was noticed that Maryland was vigilantly eyeing Valentino as he walked around the room. After roughly ten minutes, Valentino stopped just in front of where Maryland was stood, so that he could ask a few questions of Madison, but they both failed to notice that Maryland had managed to take Valentino's wallet from his back pocket, whilst he was stood in front of her, until an AVOX came over and pointed this out to Madison, which resulted in Maryland furiously punching the AVOX. Over the next minute, a brawl occurred between Maryland, the AVOX, Valentino, two of the peacekeepers, and even two of the stylists who had been caught in the crossfire. Delaware quickly became overwhelmed, and he marched off to the balcony, but instead of stopping this fight, Madison rather strangely decided to follow Delaware to the balcony. It is not known what they spoke about whilst they were there, but after the fight had been quashed a few minutes later, Madison and Delaware re-entered the apartment, with the latter now noticeably calmer. After Marilyn's teeth were finally prized apart from the AVOX's right hand, Madison casually asked Valentino if he had decided what he would like the tributes to wear. He then looked at Marilyn's bruised face and with a sneer stated, Black, to match your eye, whilst pointing at her, before turning with a flurry of his cape and leaving, swiftly followed by his team of stylists. Madison then began to chastise Marilyn for having attempted to take Valentino's wallet, but Delaware simply sat down in a chair and rested in apparent exhaustion. Yet as Marilyn began to scream back at Madison, he diverted his attention to the screen, where the final reaping was taking place. Last year's victor, Sandy Selleck, arrived in District 1, appearing slightly alarmed after bearing witness to the chaos that always ensued at each District 2 reaping. However, she was immediately in awe at seeing the elegant reaping area in person. Although few tributes had volunteered to showcase their skills this year, due to the district's recent losing streak. The ones who did volunteer to compete, though, appeared full of stubborn energy, and hoping to prove themselves worthy of saving District 1's reputation, ten years after their last victory. For the talent section, several female tributes hurled weapons or put on lavish performances for the enraptured audience. 18-year-old Mirai Kobayashi was surprisingly one of the least flashy candidates to compete this year, despite her being the next in line to a family legacy of jewellery modelling. She withdrew a matched set of butterfly swords from the folds of her shirt, and in one swift motion, stabbed them into a target whilst using the force from her motion to backflip over the target. She then landed smoothly on her feet, having pulled the knives out while in the air. Mirai was then seen borrowing a pen from the podium, doodling on another target so the centre contained a drawing that vaguely resembled another competitor in the talent section, Star Fedosa, and without hesitation, backhanding one of her knives into the centre of Star's forehead. As the audience applauded enthusiastically, to the real Star's annoyance, Mirai blew slightly on the edge of her free knight, as if mimicking blowing smoke off a gun. She was immediately voted into the next round, as the audience in District 1 applauded at this bold show. Soon. It was the male's turn to demonstrate their talents. 16-year-old Kyan Jones quickly stood out to viewers for his impressive but entertaining display of manoeuvres with a spear and shield, shadowboxing an unseen opponent. 
At one point, he appeared to somersault and then blew a kiss to the audience, sending some of the teenage population into hysterics and forcing peacekeepers to intervene and keep the noise levels down. Few other male competitors could compare to this feat of acting and swordsmanship, and Kayan was quickly voted to advance to the next round. In the debate round, Mirai appeared calm and collected as she discussed her proficiency with bladed weapons and ability to handle pressure, while Kayan's charisma was such that he had half the audience swooning for him as he described his extensive combat training compared to his opponents. With the other lacklustre male competitors, and the fact that a brawl had to be broken up between several among the female competitors due to one insinuating others had been intimate with the mayor in an attempt to be named tribute, Mirai Kobayashi and Kayan Jones were voted in by the audience to be this year's tributes for District 1. Mirai was seen at the Justice Building, nodding in an alert and focused manner as her parents spoke hushed words of encouragement and advice to her, and she squared her shoulders as if preparing for war. Kayan was caught by cameras hugging a younger sister and a nervous looking father, assuring them that he would do his best in the arena. The two were escorted to the train and briefly made polite small talk before being introduced to their mentor, Estelle Van Roosh Harrington. Estelle appeared dishevelled and disorientated and apologised to the tributes as she had just been involved in sorting out the carnage from the catfight at the reaping. She sat down across from the pair and spoke to them seriously, reminding them that District 1 had not fared at all well in recent years, suffering such humiliations as being run over by a trash compactor a couple of years back. Estelle also insisted that she was counting on this pair to restore honour to the district, after her many disappointments over the past several years, but her voice was quite defeated and tired as it was clear that she had repeated this speech many times before to no effect. She also told them that she could see potential in them, despite only having vision in one eye, pointing at her impaired eye with vague amusement. After witnessing their performances at the reaping, she advised them to work together and proved to the audiences that they were what District 1 needed to win. Estelle also advised Mirai and Kayan to not align themselves with District 2, as she heard that District 2 tributes had often been told in recent years not to ally with District 1 due to their poor performances. The trio then spent the rest of their brief time re-watching District 1 victories, with Estelle occasionally commenting relevant advice as she observed from watching past Victor's games and advising her mentees to take diligent mental notes. As they arrived at Snow Station, Estelle tiredly encouraged them to have chins up, confident eyes, and to give them the District 1 razzle-dazzle. However, the tributes appeared alarmed when the capital audiences only cheered politely, rather than the usual enthusiasm they had seen in earlier games. The pair seemed to look at their mentor as if asking for help, but she just sighed and moved them through the obligatory photos and signatures without much ceremony. They were then escorted uneventfully to their apartment for the games. As the pair from District 1 settled into their apartment, they were introduced to their stylist, Vipzania Platt. Vipzania was a friend of Estelle's, being a cousin of her now husband, Grenadino Harrington, and the two exchanged warm greetings as Vipzania showed the group her design. Mirai and Kayan appeared pleased to see that Vipsania had covered their modesty properly in the designs, as Kayan remarked that he was glad the outfits were not just a showering of gold dust and nothing else like in the previous year. Instead, they were to be dressed in a silk dress and suit, covered with one of each type of gemstone produced by District 1, which made for a spectacular rainbow display on the costumes. Both Estelle and her tributes were dazzled by the sparkling designs, and Vipsania expressed that she had high hopes for a good review from Anderson Fashion, and that their outfits would inspire capital sponsors to begin having faith in District 1 again. The next evening, the pair had their costumes fitted and makeup applied, before being summoned to the tribute parade. While helping Mirai up onto the chariot due to her long dress, Kyan was spotted blatantly flirting with Hathor from Five, who was waiting for his district's horses to be bridled. However, this caused Kyan to be distracted, and he accidentally let go of Mirai's hand. She proceeded to slip on her own skirt and fall backwards, landing in a humiliated heap on her bottom next to the chariot. A visibly irritated Mirai was quickly helped back up by an attendant, and although she could not harm Kayan due to the resulting disqualification from the games, it certainly appeared she was ready to do so. Instead, Mirai crossed her arms and flashed Kayan a dirty look. What happened next was not caught by cameras, as Mirai's voluminous skirts were obscuring their view of the events, but Kayan let out a yelp of apparent pain and clutched his groin area as the edges of a stiletto heel escaped back into Mirai's skirts. 
Mirai was seen faintly smiling a second later. As for Maryland and Delaware, they were only accompanied to the Avenue of the Tributes by Madison, due to Valentino allegedly refusing to spend any more time around Maryland than he needed. Shortly before the tributes were due to mount their carriages, Delaware quietly told Madison that he felt sick, and after checking his temperature, she told him that this was likely an effect of his detox from morphling, but that he should simply breathe in deeply, which he proceeded to do. After a minute, he appeared slightly less anxious, and thanked Madison as he mounted his chariot. However, whilst Madison was taking care of Delaware on one side of the carriage, Maryland had found a note and attached bag that were pinned to the wheel at the other side of the carriage, which he sneakily opened and was later revealed to contain a large supply of morphling tablets. She quickly read the note, but it was not visible to the cameras, before swallowing a tablet and shoving the bag containing the rest into her pocket, then climbing onto the chariot. During the parade, despite their incident earlier, Kyan and Mirai displayed charm and grace to the audience, raising their hands together and waving to the crowd. Kyan's smile appeared a bit forced, most likely attempting to mask his apparent pain. Mirai was seen with a serene and composed expression, as she used her spare hand to wave regally at the audience. However, Kyan was seen dramatically blowing kisses to the viewers, as he had done at the reaping, and pretended to catch invisible kisses thrown back at him, causing his district partner to scowl as he almost fell off the chariot in his enthusiasm. Aside from their performance at the parade, the pair from one were awarded Best Dressed by Anderson Fashion, due to the awe of Ipsania's glittering designs inspired in audiences that night. Following Madison's advice, Delaware tried to take Marilyn's hand, but she quickly rejected it. He therefore waved at the audience and appeared to make a good impression, with many people waving back and shouting his name. However, Marilyn appeared to be in a drug-induced trance, which stopped her forming a decent connection with the audience. Furthermore, during President Gall's speech, she appeared to be very slowly dancing, without a care in the world, which caused her to fall back slightly on her chariot. This caused a clanging of metal as Maryland gripped onto one of the bars, which distracted the president and he had to restart his sentence. Mirai, Kyan, Estelle and Vipsania celebrated back at the apartment, although Kyan was observed drinking an excess of champagne and drunkenly proposing marriage to Vipsania. She promptly declined and immediately arranged for Avis's to clear away all the remaining champagne. Meanwhile, Estelle had been having a deep conversation with Mirai about her weaponry and training background, learning that Mirai had often been subjected to harassment while on set as a jewellery model, and had thus developed strong self-defence skills on her own and with private trainers. Mirai admitted, however, that Kyan had better hand-to-hand -hand combat training, while she was better at solo manoeuvres. This conversation was soon interrupted by Kyan weeping at Vipsania's feet about the alcohol being taken away, and it was at this point that Estelle decided her tribute should call it a night. Vipsania agreed, having difficulty taking even a single step without Kyan clinging to her and groaning loudly about the loss of the champagne. Thus the tributes were sent to their rooms for the night. Later that evening, during the post-parade analysis, Delaware and Marilyn's long dark robes were not well received, but instead criticised for being too simple. However, Madison was most annoyed when she examined Marilyn closely, to see that she was under the effects of morphling, but even after a rather strenuous interrogation, Marilyn refused to admit where she had accessed this drug. As Madison angrily spoke to a peacekeeper, Marilyn quietly asked Delaware if he wanted some, whilst pointing to the bag that was sticking out of her sock. Although he was clearly very tempted, he simply told her that he wanted to stay clean for the training tomorrow. Marilyn begged him again, saying that she had been informed that she could access more of the drug, if Delaware agreed to take some. He appeared even more tempted, but before he could respond, Madison came over and told Marilyn to go to bed. After being threatened with a peacekeeper, she eventually complied, and Madison spoke to Delaware about the training the next day. He appeared to be listening carefully, and he mentioned that he enjoyed using paints and other colours in order to create pictures, so Madison advised him to work in the camouflage station the next day, and to go to bed now. However, just as Delaware was heading to his room, he quickly veered off into the toilet instead, and despite grimacing at the sounds that she heard from outside the door, Madison reminded Delaware that detox is a rather strange process indeed. At the training centre the next morning, the tribute separated to train at their preferred stations. Kyan sparred with Lucretius from two at the hand-to-hand -hand combat station under the watchful eye of an instructor, while Mirai trained at the gauntlet obstacle courses alongside Teak and Lilac, both from Seven, who was surprisingly skilled at avoiding the trainer's wax. 
When Mirai asked these tributes how they were so agile, Lilac explained that back in District 7, it was very easy to accidentally be hit by a stray axe and lose a body part if not careful, so many District 7 tributes had developed quick reflexes as a result. Mirai appeared to make note of this, and gradually made the acquaintance of these two tributes. She particularly took interest in Lilac, and the pair would often be found at the same stations. Over the course of the two days of training, Kyan and Mirai made their way to all the stations, specifically the weaponry stations. Reportedly, the pair had an argument at the fishhook station, with Mirai quietly threatening to pierce Kyan's eyes herself with fishhooks if he did not stop showing off for the other tributes. As for the tributes from District 6, they both headed to the camouflage station. Maryland initially tried to ask for Delaware's help, but he was clearly still angry with her for the behaviour that she had exhibited the night before, and he therefore ignored her. Maryland proceeded to lather herself and her area at the station in a black, tar-like substance, which allowed her to spend most of the first day inconspicuously sleeping in the spot, whilst Delaware edited the colours and textures on the floor and wall of his own area, which allowed him to practice camouflaging against a greater variety of potential terrains. During the second day of training, Maryland once again remained in the camouflage station, but this time relaxed against a sandy-coloured wall. Delaware initially stayed with her, but he soon appeared curious regarding the events in the other stations. He then spent the day moving between stations, and seemed to enjoy working with Claire from 3 in the electronic station, as well as Miller from 9 in the survival station. He also gave the pair a basic lesson with camouflage materials, in return for them showing their expertise, which seemed to be much appreciated. Yet Miller was made to jump extremely loudly, when he was suddenly grabbed from behind by Maryland, who had snuck up behind him and appeared to think that this was funny. During their supper at the end of the second day, Madison remarked to Delaware that his skin had become a more vibrant shade, instead of the ashy pale that it had previously been, and even his posture seemed to have improved, before winking as they continued eating. Delaware looked at Maryland, in order to see her reaction, but she once again appeared absent, and Madison simply rolled her eyes when she noticed this as well. The next day, the tributes were ready to be evaluated by the assessors, and the District 1 tributes were naturally the first to go. As usual, the nature of each tribute's evaluation is not disclosed to viewers, but it was assumed that Kayan performed a highly skilled manoeuvre with swords or another bladed weapon. Mirai's evaluation was not made public either, but it was reported that one particular assessor left the room muttering about butterflies, knives, and offensive caricatures, implying it was similar to her feet at the District 1 reaping. Delaware and Maryland were roughly in the middle of the lineup. Delaware put on a strong display with a range of camouflage paints, painting and hiding himself against one background, before quickly repainting in another colour and hiding himself against a different background. He did this four times within ten minutes, and the assessors seemed surprised, yet impressed by what they saw, which ultimately scored Delaware a six, and Madison seemed content. As for Maryland, she was once again rather mysteriously under the effects of morphling, and when Madison was asked about this, she claimed to have no idea how Maryland was accessing this substance. Marilyn scored a rare one after vomiting into the camouflage paints just seconds into her demonstration, which caused a delay as the station was cleaned and the paints were replaced. When the scores were released, Kyan from one and Lucretius from two were seen tied at the top of the pack, each with a score of ten. Mirai from one, Melona from two, Sauri from four, and Lilac from seven were close behind, each scoring a nine, whilst Marilyn from six was of course at the bottom of the lineup, with the next lowest score being 4. For their interviews, Kayan and Mirai were dressed in deep purple coordinating ensembles, adorned with shimmering gems that cascaded from a pale lavender to pure onyx. Mirai was greeted by rapturous applause as she emerged on stage, to which she acknowledged with a brief inclination of her head. Eugenia appeared slightly put off by this entrance, but still greeted Mirai in a cheerful trill, and asked how she was feeling about the games. Mirai solemnly replied that she was prepared to handle any arena, mutts, or adverse situation, as long as she did not have to handle her district partner, Kayan. Eugenia then asked if Mirai had a special summon at home, to which she answered none, but that any eligible lady should send her agent their resume, prompting the audience to laugh as Eugenia mimed writing a cover letter. For her final comments in her interview, she leaned forward sharply in her chair, to declare that District 1 was no longer a district of glamour models, but rather now of stubborn survivors, earning loud applause. Even Eugenia politely clapped for this last statement, 
as Mirai curtsied and exited the stage. When it was Kyan's turn, he cheerfully bantered with Eugenia, assuring her that she had not yet even seen Mirai on a bad day, and asking if she knew any eligible bachelors in the capital who might be willing to sponsor him, both in the arena and out. When Eugenia pointed out that Kyan certainly appeared to be living up to his reputation as a flirt, he hastily corrected her, and preferred to describe himself as romantically inclined, causing the audience to groan and chuckle at the same time. Finally, he ended his interview by calling out Eugenia's husband in the audience, and boldly asking for his phone number in case he got bored of Eugenia. Now slightly irritated, Eugenia quickly shooed Kyan off stage to allow for the next tribute. Delaware and Maryland were dressed in a sparkling black suit and dress, respectively, along with white shirts and collars. Delaware had even opted to shave off his beard, and his skin had turned a rather healthy shade of beige, which became particularly clear during his interview, especially when Eugenia showed a picture of him that evening, compared with how he was during his reaping, which even triggered some wolf whistling. That said, he did not seem to show much intuition for the games themselves, and he was still predicted by many capital citizens to be eliminated early. Maryland was rather unsurprisingly under the effects of morphling once more, with Madison apparently giving up on trying to find out where she was getting it from. However, Marilyn did manage to give some relatively coherent responses to some of the questions that were posed by Eugenia, who even joked that if Marilyn won the games, she would love to go out with her for a night at Breen's any time. Yet as Marilyn left the stage, she forgot to shake Eugenia's hand, then rather embarrassingly clomped her foot against the chair as she turned. After the interviews, Madison and Valentino took their tributes back to the apartment, where they had some capital cake and wine with Delaware, who very surprisingly declined the wine that Madison had offered him. Even though Marilyn was also offered this food and drink, she said that she needed some fresh air and headed to the balcony. However, after a few minutes, Delaware said that he would also like to get some air, and Madison happily excused him to the balcony, but as he opened the door, he was shocked to see Marilyn taking a small bottle from a basket that was being lowered on a rope. Delaware shouted at Marilyn, who jolted around in shock. He then ran to the edge of the balcony before looking up this rope to see Asher Seetel, victor at the 78th Hunger Games, holding on to the other end of the rope on the balcony above. Madison heard the ensuing commotion and she sprinted over to the balcony before checking the other end of the rope that was still being grabbed onto by Delaware. She then shouted at Asher at such a high volume and level of obscenity that peacekeepers in both women's apartments were forced to intervene. Madison and Delaware were pulled inside their apartment and Delaware spent several minutes trying to convince Madison that he did not know that this was where the morphling had been coming from. Still extremely furious, Madison did not appear to believe Delaware, and she continually repeated that addicts make good liars, but he continued to plead his innocence. After another strenuous interrogation, Marilyn confessed to Madison that she had first received morphling when Asher left some on the carriage wheel, with an attached note stating that she would be offered even more if she convinced Delaware to have some. Maryland went on to admit that Asher had sent it down to her each evening via the balcony, which made Madison smash a glass in anger, before yelling to Maryland to go to bed. Madison then asked the peacekeepers how Asher would be punished for offering these substances to her tributes, but much to her disappointment, they informed her that each tribute was their mentor's responsibility, and so there was nothing that they could do. Although one peacekeeper did quietly state to Madison on the way out that night that she could always return the favour. The next day, tributes were taken to the launch rooms beneath the arena. The District 1 tributes prepared to enter their tubes and dress themselves in the puffy white jackets and trousers provided, as instructed by the peacekeepers. Estelle accompanied Mirai, while Vipsania accompanied Kyan. Estelle was seen reminding a stony-faced Mirai to remember her training and prove herself in the arena to be more than a pretty face, but rather a threat that others would not see coming due to District 1's recent losses. Vipsania aided an alert looking Kyan in zipping his jacket, reminding him simply to never give up and to do anything necessary to win. Estelle told Mirai that she trusted her to bring honour back to their district as the tube opened, to which Mirai nodded solemnly. Meanwhile, Kyan was noticed on camera making a rather awkward joke to Vipsania about how he would potentially be pulling a panatana in the arena should he be desperate for supplies. The tribute squared their shoulders and stepped into the tubes. When given the choice of which tribute she would see off, Madison immediately chose Delaware. Although this would normally mean that the stylist, in this case Valentino, would see off the other tribute, he allegedly refused to meet with Maryland. 
She therefore had to get dressed by herself into her white jacket and trousers, along with her black t-shirt, before entering her tube. As it sealed, she actually looked quite lost, and tears were forming in her sagging eyes. As for Delaware, Madison said that she was extremely proud of him for having been strong enough to avoid morphling for the last week, and that if he could beat this addiction, he could beat these games. Delaware smiled and thanked Madison. She nodded and gave him a strong embrace, before seeing him into the tube, which subsequently rose into the arena. This year's games took place in a snowy desert. The inside sectors of this rather small arena were mainly comprised of sandy flatlands, but as one began to travel further outwards, the ground gradually rose, along with the amount of snow that covered it. There were also more stray rocks, frozen lakes, raised dunes, and even waddles of loud, honking penguins towards the outer sectors. As for the perimeter, it was formed of entire mountains, which even featured small forests at their lower altitudes. The cornucopia itself lay in the centre of the arena, within a small sandy clearing that was bordered by a circular pattern of large cobalt rocks. The podiums lay in a semicircle around the edge of this clearing, with the usual supplies of food and water scattered towards them, whilst the more valuable items such as sleeping bags, tarpaulins and medicine lay nearer to the cornucopia. However, in a rare twist, the only weapons that were featured within the cornucopia were a large selection of ice picks, with small and less powerful ones bundled together in the mouth of the cornucopia, whilst the larger ones with more potential were placed towards the back wall. After rising into the arena, the District 1 tributes regarded the area around them, heads on a swivel, immediately searching for opportunities and surveying the area around the cornucopia. While Kyan from 1 was located between Miller from 9 and Insula from 12, Mirai from 1 appeared several podiums to his right, between Claire from 3 and Gazar from 8, although both tributes were relatively to the south of the cornucopia's mouth. In recent years, the training academies in the district had become overcrowded and thus had not offered the highest quality of training, but they still had been taught to inspect their surroundings for advantages and disadvantages. As the countdown commenced, the tributes observed that the centre appeared to be more sandy and flat, while several mountains and lakes were bordering the very outside edge of the arena. Kyan was seen eyeing a large selection of ice picks in the mouth of the cornucopia, afterwards making eye contact with Mirai, who nudged her head to indicate she would be searching for the food, tarpaulins and sleeping bags closer to them. As for Delaware and Maryland, both from six, they had seemed unsure of their surroundings when they rose into the arena. Delaware was stood on a central podium between Thibaut from 11 and Darien from 10, and they each seemed as phased as Delaware was to finally be in the arena. He briefly looked at them before looking forward, but soon appeared overwhelmed by what lay ahead. His breathing quickened and he even closed his eyes, but when only ten seconds remained, he looked straight ahead and appeared to focus on a nearby loaf of bread. Maryland, on the other hand, was positioned on the furthest podium to the right, with Jamie from 14 as her only neighbouring tribute. Despite the relatively cold temperatures of this arena, she was visibly sweating. Furthermore, she did not appear to be paying attention to what lay ahead, but instead behind, to the mountains in the distance. Ennius quickly listed who he thought would run away when the gong sounded, and Maryland was one of the tributes about which he sounded the most certain. When the gong sounded, the two tributes from one sprinted forwards off their podiums, amid the flurry of sand being kicked up by the other tributes running to and away from the cornucopia. Shielding her eyes with her arm, Mirai was very nearly caught in the shoulder by an ice pick, hurled violently and blindly by Miller from Nine, who had been aiming at Lucretius from two. However, the ice pick instead flew into Palmer from Ten's head, lodging itself firmly in his skull. Cayenne successfully wrenched an ice pick out of the hands of Glutina from Nine, who had just seized it from near the cornucopia, and angrily bashed her in the chest with it, shouting that it was rude to budge in line. In the meantime, Mirai was attacked from behind by Nessa from 14, while picking up a pair of sleeping bags, a tarp, and some rations. However, she noticed Nessa's shadow approaching on the sand and quickly spun around, rolling out of the way as Nessa's ice pick cleaved through the sand where Mirai had been crouching a moment earlier. As Nessa attempted to dislodge the pick from the sand, Mirai used her momentum to leap to her feet, kick Nessa in the chest away from her, and slash her neck with the pick. Mirai flipped her hair over her shoulder and nodded at Kayan to indicate they needed to leave. Having gathered all the supplies they needed, Kayan and Mirai fled the cornucopia, 
as Darien was brutally bashed to death with ice picks by both tributes from two. The pair from one headed northwest, towards one of the few frozen lakes near the edge of the arena, figuring that most tributes would have scattered after the bloodbath, and there were likely to be fewer tributes in any given area. As for Maryland, she had proved Aeneas wrong. When the gong sounded, she slowly turned back around to face the cornucopia, before sprinting behind Jamie. Maryland had somewhat accidentally managed to create a sufficient delay that allowed her to not be seen behind the front wave of tributes as she ran to the cornucopia. Maryland then carefully sprinted past Miller, who had just thrown an ice pick at Palmar, without attracting the former's attention. She then spotted some binoculars on the ground, and coming to a rather unusual standstill next to them, she appeared curious as to what they were. She picked them up before running straight ahead to the cornucopia, and almost running into Darien, who had just grabbed a bundle of small ice picks from the entrance of the structure. The girls looked at each other for a split second, before Maryland held the strap of the binoculars while swinging them at Darien, who moved herself quickly enough to only receive a small injury on her neck. Yet Darien then lunged forwards and stabbed an ice pick into Marilyn's throat as she ran past, which saw Marilyn fall to the ground whilst clutching this wound. As for Delaware, he also ran inwards when the gong sounded, but stopped as soon as he reached a loaf of bread. He picked it up before looking ahead as the carnage began to unfold. However, he saw a sleeping bag just a few metres to his right that appeared to have been ignored by those whose podiums were positioned nearest to it. Delaware ran towards this sleeping bag and snatched it from the ground, but just as he looked tempted to run further towards the cornucopia, an ice pick suddenly flew towards him after Thibaut from Eleven had thrown it. Fortunately for Delaware, it only hit his clavicle, which allowed it to bounce off his body without causing much harm. He then spotted Maryland being stabbed with an ice pick by Darien, and rather wisely fled to his right, where the nearest rocks marked the edge of the cornucopia clearing. Yet shortly after passing through these rocks, Delaware ran straight into Twill from Eight, who appeared to have been waiting for her district partner, Gazar, which resulted in them both collapsing to the ground. They looked at each other in a mixture of shock and terror, but Delaware quickly grabbed the cheese that Twill had dropped, and she appeared too shaken by what had just happened to challenge him, which allowed him to sprint off into the southeastern sector of the arena. Kai and Amirai became winded as they trudged northwest through the snowy sand, each wielding an ice pick and carrying a rolled up sleeping bag with food and water inside. Eventually, they stopped at the perimeter of one of the frozen lakes, which Kayan dubbed Lake Kayan in honour of himself. Mirai was seen promptly rolling her eyes at this sentiment. As the pair set up a small camp, Kayan was quick to observe that there seemed to be a few stray penguins wandering around the lake area. While Mirai rolled out their sleeping bags reluctantly and began dividing up portions of food for lunch, Kayan ambled over to one of the penguins nearby, which cocked its head at him curiously as Kyan recognised that these penguins seemed similar to those from another past games, although he could not recall which one. He imitated the penguin, inclining his head as well, and it appeared to lose interest and began waddling away. Excited, Kyan was seen pursuing the penguin and flapping his arms in a similar way. However, when the penguin turned around and saw this, it was not amused and angrily honked at him. Kyan stuck his tongue out in an apparent gesture of defiance, and at that moment, the irritated penguin waddled back to him and bit his exposed hand. Kayan cried out in alarm, now nursing a hand wound, and fled back to Mirai as the penguin wandered away. He complained loudly about his injured hand, and Mirai applied some snow to staunch the bleeding, before chastising him, saying he needed to stop flirting with everything that had a pulse. He promised to be more serious for the rest of the games, a promise Mirai did not seem sure he would uphold, but accepted it anyway. Just then, the five cannons from the bloodbath sounded. Meanwhile, Delaware had spent the first hour travelling across the dunes, at first sprinting, then jogging, until he finally came to a standstill upon a hill near the perimeter that was covered equally in snow and sand. He was clearly exhausted and appeared thirsty, but Eugenia quickly pointed out that he had not taken any water from the bloodbath, with Aeneas adding that he was going to regret this. However, as Delaware rested and looked out into the distance, Eugenia stated that he was unknowingly sat within a hundred metres of a frozen lake that housed plenty of fresh water beneath its icy surface. Yet a greater threat soon emerged when he spotted the bloody jackets of Lucretius and Melona, both from two, contrasted against the white snow, coming over the dunes in the distance and approaching his position. Delaware at first squinted at them, before appearing worried and beginning to curse as he realised the danger that was slowly nearing. Aeneas jokingly said that he loved it when the weaklings tried to hide, 
whilst Delaware began to dig within the ground below him. At first he did this rather slowly, possibly due to the cold temperature of the snow, but he soon sped up as he burrowed through the sand and within five minutes had managed to create a shallow grave within the ground. Whilst only one dune now lay between these career tributes and Delaware, he quickly placed himself inside his sleeping bag, along with his bread and cheese, before lying down in this grave and then covering himself with the sand and then snow that he had uprooted from the ground. As Melona and Lucretius moved closer to Delaware, he grabbed as much of the snow as he could, before covering it over his sleeping bag, then laying his arms within the snow, where the white fabric of his jacket allowed them to become camouflaged. Although Delaware began to shiver, he quickly put some thick snow over his brown hair, and as Melona and Lucretius finally walked over the horizon of the nearest dune, Delaware snapped his arms down to his side. Snow Square was completely silent with suspense as the pair unknowingly neared Delaware's hiding place, whilst discussing where they believed the other tributes to be. Lucretius then stopped just metres from Delaware, who opened his eyelids very slightly to see where Lucretius was standing before quickly closing them. Lucretius continued through the list of districts, and it was noticed that when Melona said, The sixes? Who cares? Delaware's dark pupils once again became visible in the snow, but he remained still as the pair finally walked past, narrowly avoiding his feet. Yet within seconds, Delaware's teeth actually began chattering together from the cold, but he appeared to put his lips between them so that they would not create too much sound. However, this led Melona to look around and say to Lucretius that she could hear something. The pair surveyed the clearing through which they had just walked, whilst Delaware was seen to screw up his eyes, but fortunately for him, they appeared to believe that it was a sound produced by a distant penguin before continuing north. As Delaware finally appeared to relax a few minutes later, he carefully removed himself from his sleeping bag before eating some cheese and trying to rub his arms in order to warm himself up. Just as he finally seemed to feel some warmth, he heard the five cannons from the bloodbath sounding. As for Kayan, he was not in an excellent mood for the rest of the day, although he agreed to help when Mirai asked if they should build a shelter out of some of the tightly packed snow around the lake. The pair successfully constructed a shoddy but workable shelter from their top over the course of the afternoon and agreed to take turns guarding it at night. During their brief dinner, the pair discussed their lives back in District 1 and how different things had been in recent years. Kyan had worked in the Carter Emerald Mine to support his father and sister, as his father was ill with the terminal disease and could not work, although he hoped to win and get his father medical care from the capital. Mirai had been raised in a family of wealthy jewellers, and had herself been modelling for the family's jewellery line for several years, but she appeared rather touched by Kyan's story. She also explained to Kyan that if she won, she would open a self-defence training agency, as she had been harassed before while working as a model, and did not want others to endure the same thing. The pair were interrupted in their deep conversation by a rustling noise from outside the shelter, and both immediately shot to their feet. Kyan and Mirai readied their ice picks, alert for any sign of danger. Kyan crept out of the shelter to peer around at the lake shore, to his shock, so much that he dropped his ice pick. The rustling offender was in fact the penguin from earlier. As Kyan sighed in relief and informed Mirai that it was just a penguin, the bird honked very loudly at him. Mirai joined Kyan outside the shelter to investigate the intruder, and to her alarm it approached her and leaned on her leg, refusing to move. The bewildered pair debated about how to handle this unexpected situation, and eventually decided on bringing the penguin into the shelter for the night, believing it to be feeling cold. Most other tributes also sheltered and slept as the darkness set in, with Delaware snuggling within his sleeping bag beneath the snow-covered sand at the bottom of the nearest dune. As Horn of Plenty was played at midnight and pictures of the Fallen were shown in the sky during Kyan's watch, he appeared to be calculating the number of tributes left, which was now 21, due to the deaths of Maryland from 6, Glutina from 9, Palmar and Darian both from 10, and Nessa from 14. The next morning, the pair decided to go fishing in Lake Kyan. Mirai broke a small area of congealed ice on the lake with her ice pick, and their new penguin friend dived into the water, succeeding at retrieving a fish about once in every four attempts. Kyan deemed the penguin useful enough to receive a name, and declared it to be named Kyan Jr. Surprisingly, this creative fishing manoeuvre proved to be popular with audiences, and a sponsor gift drifted down near the pair's shelter. They were pleased to discover a pair of logs and a set of matches, allowing them to cook the fish. Mirai started a small fire to cook their fish outside the shelter, and the trio enjoyed a fulfilling breakfast. Moments after they had finished their meal, 
Kyan leapt to his feet, his face pale and terrified. He pointed frantically across the lake, where a pair of tributes could be seen hurrying towards them. The pair dropped their fish and quickly readied their ice picks, as Kyan Jr. quietly honked in confusion. However, to their astonishment, the approaching tributes did not appear hostile, and in fact did not seem to be armed. Mirai squinted and identified the pair as Teak and Lilac, both from Seven. Lilac nudged Teak and they raised their arms, seemingly in a gesture of peace. Mirai appeared excited to see Lilac, although Kyan seemed suspicious of the tribute's intentions. Lilac explained that they had fled the bloodbath with just two sleeping bags and some food and water, as the pair from Two had attacked a tribute near them, and they had not wanted to stick around. The pair from Seven also appeared interested in the stable shelter constructed by the tributes from One. Teak and Lilac asked to ally with the District One tributes, having worked with Mirai at the training center and hoping to share supplies. Kyan and Mirai and Kyan Jr. privately conferred in a chorus of whispers before agreeing to admit the District Seven pair into their alliance. Mirai in particular appeared very pleased to be cooperating with Lilac and vice versa, as the girls worked very closely to set up their sleeping bags. As for Delaware, he was the last tribute to awaken that morning, after a night of restless turning and whispering in his sleep. He had also appeared to be sweating over his forehead, and as he got out of his sleeping bag, he clutched his stomach in what appeared to be a tense cramp. Eugenia stated that these were common symptoms of morphling withdrawal, with Ennius adding that these symptoms had been seen from other tributes in past games, most notably those from District 6. Eugenia then asked him if morphling withdrawal would really happen a week after tributes had stopped using it, to which Ennius replied that the strain that was most common in District 6 was extremely potent and would often remain in one system for some time, which would cause withdrawal symptoms to appear later. As Delaware's pain seemed to gradually ease, he ate some of his bread that had spent the night with him in his sleeping bag, but as he relaxed, he began to hear some shouting and honking from not too far away, which prompted him to quickly get back into his sleeping bag and into the shallow grave, before covering himself in ice again. It was shown to viewers that the shouting belonged to Thibaut from Eleven, who had had his water bottle taken just a few hundred metres away. However, Delaware had no idea of this, and remained for the rest of the morning in his self-made grave of ice. For the rest of the morning, the new alliance of Districts 1 and 7 set up their camp and chatted. Mirai and Lilac got on quite well, considering Mirai was a strong but silent type, and Lilac talked enough to dominate the entire conversation. Teak and Kyan proudly showed off their penguin bites to each other, as Teak could also run afoul of a group of the birds after chasing them around a mountain base. The group's peaceful afternoon, however, was not to last long. Shortly after they had eaten a small lunch, it was announced to all tributes remaining that they would have 20 minutes to take a pair of headphones in the cornucopia, or else they would fall victim to a sonic surge that would be sent through the arena. Once again, Kyan identified to the rest of his allies that this seemed familiar, and that he thought he had recalled something similar in the previous games. The group fully intended to collect their pairs of headphones, but with only two ice picks between the four, they could not all reasonably go to pick them up. Eventually, it was decided that Teak and Mirai would attend the event and pick up four pairs of headphones, while Kyan and Lilac stayed behind with Kyan Jr. to guard the supplies and shelter. Teak and Mirai headed southeast to the cornucopia, equipped with the group's ice picks, and staked out the area while hiding behind a large rock. As they headed to the cornucopia from one side of the arena, a panicked Delaware ran through the other side, after having quickly buried his supplies within his sleeping bag. He appeared to have trouble breathing as he ran, and was ultimately one of the last and near the cornucopia, where he lay down in the nearby snow and watched other tributes beginning to run through the cobalt rocks and into the cornucopia clearing. Teak and Mirai quietly observed, anxiously hoping the twenty minutes would not pass quickly. They watched in shock and admiration as Karel from Three emerged from inside the cornucopia, snatched two pairs, and sprinted into a rocky space across from them as he tossed a pair to his district partner. Claire from three. Moments later, Sauri from four came running into the clearing, apparently hoping to get in and out as fast as possible, but he was quickly ambushed by Lucretius and Malona. The District 2 pair had been hiding in another rock cluster with ice picks at the ready, but Sauri was too slow to escape their watchful gaze. Lucretius snatched two pairs of headphones, while Malona buried her pick in Sauri's chest and sounded his cannon. Unfortunately for the other tributes, Lucretius and Malona were now guarding the headphones, meaning anyone who wished to obtain a pair would either have to risk the wrath of the careers, or face certain death from the sonic surge. 
Fortunately for those watching, anyone entering from outside the cornucopia was unaware of this fact. Only seconds after the hovercraft had collected Sauri's body, Katla from Four skidded to a stop outside the clearing as she realised the body of her district partner was now being lifted into the sky. It was too late for Katla though, as the careers descended on her and hacked at her with their picks. Teak elbowed Mirai, and they shot out of their hiding place as quickly as possible to seize four pairs of headphones. Several other tributes had this same idea, and the pair from Two turned around to see an entirely new brawl taking place as many tributes wrestled over the remaining pairs of headphones. The District Two tributes looked at each other, shrugged, and joined the fray, with Melona killing Electrabel from Five as she bent over to take a pair that had fallen on the ground. Most tributes used this window of opportunity to hurry out of the clearing, clutching headphones. Teek and Mirai had their arms full of headphones and were about to escape, when Lucretius noticed them edging out of the clearing and shouting for Melona to help him attack them. The pair kept running, but Lucretius threw his ice pick, and it embedded itself in Teek's back, causing him to cry out in pain and drop his weapon, and the two pairs of headphones he was carrying. Mirai appeared to realise they would have to put up some kind of fight in order to have a chance to escape due to Teek's injury, and she seized Teek's ice pick from off the ground, now double-wielding their picks as Jamie from 14 narrowly ran past her with a pair of headphones that he had just about taken. Melona tossed Lucretius her pick to arm him, rendering him distracted for a split second. Mirai charged at him this time and shoved the heel of her palm upwards, striking him in the nose and causing an unpleasant crunching noise as he staggered backwards. However, instead of continuing to attack the recovering tribute, she instead hurled one of her picks directly into a shocked Melona's chest from afar, sounding her cannon as it was embedded in her heart. Lucretius had quickly recuperated from his injury and was now charging at Mirai with Melona's pick. Viewers were astonished as Mirai appeared to stand perfectly still for a moment with her eyes closed, with most audience members in Snow Square shouting for her to take action and defend herself from Lucretius. Instead, she simply dived to the right into a pile of sand. Lucretius was unable to stop his forward momentum from continuing, and he skidded through the sand and smacked into one of the rocks around the cornucopia, laying dazed on the ground. Mirai took full advantage of this time to flee, grabbing three pairs of headphones, but stopped as she approached the moaning teak. He was face down in the sand and appeared to be in great pain from the ice pick in his back. Mirai hesitated while clearly calculating something, but soon apologised to Teek as she removed the ice pick from his shoulder and buried it in his head, sounding his cannon. Meanwhile, Jamie was one of the last to exit the cornucopia clearing, after Hathor from Five had very nearly managed to throw an ice pick at his head. Jamie then darted between the stones that surrounded the cornucopia, but he appeared phased by the near miss that he had just encountered and stood still to catch his breath as he finally made his way through the stones. Yet just as Jamie began to look around, he failed to spot Delaware, who had been stood next to this exit between the stones. Jamie raised his ice pick in defence, but Delaware pushed on his arm and grabbed him by the throat, before smacking his head against the stone behind him. Although this had not killed Jamie, it rendered him unconscious and he collapsed to the floor, which allowed Delaware to snatch his ice pick, water bottle, and most importantly his headphones, before running back towards his previous resting place. Mirai made it back to the Alliance camp with only 30 seconds remaining before the sonic surge, and the three allies quickly put on their headphones. While they were waiting for the surge to occur, Mirai hurriedly explained to her allies, in a very loud voice due to the noise cancellation in the headphones, that the rush for headphones had been quite chaotic, and Teek had been attacked by the pair from two while they fled, while carefully leaving out her role in Teek's death. The sonic surge then began, which caused Miller from 9, Insula from 12, and Jamie from 14, who did not possess headphones, to die rather gruesome deaths, whilst the survivors fled. Ennius remarked that this rush for headphones had practically resulted in a second bloodbath for this year. Lila appeared upset by the loss of her district partner, but stated that she was glad she did not have to kill him. The Alliance members winced and sheltered together as they felt the intense friction of the surge pass through the arena, completely drowning out the sound of cannons firing to indicate the few less fortunate tributes who had not succeeded in obtaining a pair of headphones. Lilac and Mirai appeared to be huddling quite close in particular. Kyan placed his hands over the sides of Kyan Jr.'s head in an attempt to shield the penguin from the blast, although little did he know that the penguins already had ear-protecting equipment placed inside the opening of their ears. Meanwhile, some of the other penguins that had been wandering about the area seemed slightly annoyed by the blast, and began to honk disruptively. Agitated, 
Lilac separated herself from the District 1 tributes to berate the Penguins for possibly giving up their location. Although this failed, and they only honked louder. However, the Penguins appeared to leave, when Kai and Junior honked authoritatively at them. As for Delaware, he had safely made it back to his previous resting spot, whilst gripping his headphones as the sonic surge swept through the arena. After a few minutes, he deemed it safe to take off his headphones, which he placed in his sleeping bag with his other supplies and ice pick, before resting inside it as well. Yet after a few minutes of lying in his sleeping bag in the shallow grave of snow once more, Delaware appeared to find this too hot, and he quickly got out, before breathing in exhaustion. He then quickly took off his jacket, and large sweat marks were seen all over his t-shirt. Remarkably, he pulled off his t-shirt as well, before lying down with his back on a snowy part of the hill. Enya stated that this was making even him feel cold, but Eugenia jokingly told him not to ruin this moment. Over the next few minutes, this burst of coldness appeared to help Delaware, and his body gradually seemed to return to a normal temperature. Although his t-shirt was drenched in sweat, he seemed happy to only wear his jacket instead. As the darkness of night set in, Delaware once again camouflaged as he rested in his sleeping bag, before suddenly falling asleep shortly before midnight. Meanwhile, Mirai, Kyan, and Lilac decided to have a brief dinner, and take turns sleeping in shifts again. Kyan was once again on the first night shift, and at midnight, he observed keenly through the night sky that Melona from 2, Sauri and Katla both from 4, Electra Bell from 5, Teak from 7, Miller from 9, Insula from 12, and Jamie from 14 had all been killed that day. This brought the remaining tribute total all the way down to 13. Most exciting for Kyan, and a fact which he eagerly announced to Kyan Jr. while on watch, was that there was now only one District 2 tribute remaining. Mirai was seen to have difficulty sleeping after her eventful day, and she joined Lilac during the next shift. The pair were seen briefly chatting about life in their districts and who might still be left alive. Lilac admitted shyly that she had been rather attracted to Mirai's calm personality since they worked together in the training center, and had hoped to encounter her in the arena. Mirai appeared taken aback, but flattered by this comment, and she returned the sentiment with a slight degree of embarrassment. The girls moved slightly closer, and to many viewers it appeared as though they were about to share a kiss. Just as it appeared the two were about to embrace, or perhaps something more, Kyan burst out of the shelter, distressed that he had just had a nightmare about waking up in bed next to President Gaul. Reluctantly, the two female tributes allowed him to cower between them, as they assured him that there were no presidents of Panem in the arena. Mirai coaxed Kayan to go back to sleep in the shelter, and she herself returned to sleep in the shelter as a way to assure him that it was gall free. Kayan, Mirai, and Lilac enjoyed an uninteresting morning for the third day. Despite this, Mirai was still irritated about having lost one of their ice picks at the cornucopia during the sonic surge. Combined, the three tributes had a single weapon between them. Lilac did not appear as concerned about this though, and stated that it was highly likely that Lucretius would come looking for them, and that he would probably bring weapons, which they could steal from him during a fight. As two cannons sounded, the three stopped to speculate who might have been killed and why, hoping that there was not another arena event already after yesterday's second bloodbath. Kyan, Mirai and Lilac ate some fish for lunch, and conversed, taking turns doing unflattering impressions of some of the other tributes from the training centre. The pair from one seemed to find Lilac's portrayal of Melona as curling up her arms and hooting in a similar manner to a gorilla particularly amusing. Mirai imitated Lucretius's serious attitude in a rare moment of lightness, scowling intensely and threatening death upon a nearby waddle of penguins. The group was disrupted by a cannon in the middle of Kyan attempting some stand-up comedy, which quickly sobered the situation. This cannon was revealed to be that of Dionysia from Eleven, who had died of thirst and starvation. Delaware seemed well rested when he awoke that morning, and simply smiled from his camouflaged resting place, whilst looking into the white skies above. For the next hour, he hardly moved and appeared to be counting at random intervals, as if he were playing a game with himself. Yet almost an hour after Delaware awoke, he began to look at his surroundings, but after almost looking a full 360 degrees around him, he suddenly spotted two people in bloodied clothing, walking in a northeast direction along a dune to his west. Delaware quickly buried his sleeping bag full of supplies beneath the snow, before taking his ice pick and running sneakily behind a dune towards a clearing where this pair were due to enter. As the feed on Capital TV switched to show this upcoming altercation, 
Aeneas announced that it was Gazar and Twill, both from eight, that Delaware had seen. He lay carefully on the side of a dune, and was able to see that at their direction of travel, the pair would soon enter a snowy clearing, which featured several large rocks that lay just in front of him. Delaware quickly ran into this clearing, before hiding behind a rock and laying down, with the hood on his jacket, along with his other clothes, camouflaging him perfectly against the snow. Seconds later, Twill and Gazar entered the clearing, with Gazar resting on one of the rocks that was nearest to Delaware, and saying that he needed a rest. Twill seemed happy to oblige, and she said that she needed to relieve herself, before shuffling off behind a rock on the other side of the clearing. As Delaware slowly raised his head, he spotted Gazar a few metres in front of him, and looking to the left whilst eating some of his and Twill's bread. Delaware very carefully crept to his feet, before darting to the right, away from the eyeline of Gazar, who seemed to be daydreaming. Delaware held the ice pick ready and gradually began to curve his direction back towards Gazar, who still seemed oblivious. Supporters of District 8 that were in Snow Square shouted at him to turn around, but as Delaware crept to within metres of him, he instead asked Twill if she was almost done. As Twill replied that she had just started, Delaware seized his opportunity and stabbed Gazar in the side of the neck, whilst holding his mouth to muffle his screams. Blood squirted from Gazar's neck, and as the life left his eyes, Delaware carefully and quietly lay him down in the snow next to the rock. At that moment, Twill asked how much bread there was left, and Delaware slowly rotated towards the sound of her voice. He then crept towards Twill, who was still crouching down and urinating, but the carefully positioned camera showed only her face. Twill's expression changed from relief to confusion after not hearing a reply from Gazar. When Delaware was just seconds away, she shouted for him again, and just as she finally finished urinating, a cannon boomed out. Twill suddenly jumped up from behind the rock, and she let out a shrill scream as she saw Delaware stood just the other side, with his ice pick at the ready. She turned to run, with only her underwear correctly in place, but Delaware quickly leaped onto the rock, before diving onto Twill and then stabbing her through the neck with his ice pick. As Twill fell to the ground and began shaking, Delaware finished her off with a few more stabs, and her cannon sounded seconds later. Seeing the hovercraft enter the arena, Delaware grabbed bread and water that the pair had on them before running back to his earlier resting place. A few minutes later, Delaware reached the snowy grave and quickly attempted to clean the blood off his white clothes before putting the new supplies into his sleeping bag. As Delaware finally got into the sleeping bag as well, the cannon of Dionysia from Eleven sounded and he once again rested in the snow, whilst appearing somewhat happy that he was still safe. As evening began to set in, the alliance of Cayenne, Mirai, and Lilac observed that snow had begun to fall, and they appeared startled as it rapidly began accumulating. For the rest of the evening, they stayed warm and dry by huddling in their sleeping bags inside the snow shelter. Only minutes into the blizzard, a cannon rang out, indicating Hathor from Five had accidentally fallen through the ice on one of the frozen lakes and drowned due to low visibility. Most tributes did not even hear this cannon as a result of the overpowering winds, although Kyan was on first watch later in the night, and at that time informed Lilac and Mirai of his death. Notably, Kyan also appeared slightly saddened by this death, as he told Mirai that he had found Hathor quite attractive, and that it was a shame to see such a beefcake gone. As for Delaware, he lay within his sleeping bag beneath the snow, and he was not overly affected by the snow that fell. Yet as his intensity began to increase, his teeth soon began to chatter once more, and his breathing began to deteriorate. Delaware quickly appeared to realise that he would need to cover his face properly, and he soon got out of his sleeping bag and sat up, so that he could place his hood over his forehead. However, due to the snow that was still caught in his hair, and the ever-increasing amount that was still falling, his efforts appeared to be too little, too late. He soon developed what Eugenia described as frostbite, with the skin on his forehead turning a putrid yellow, and even blistering as he tried to rub it. Delaware began to cry with pain, and as his teeth continued to chatter, he cried out for a fix, and stated he would give anything for one, although many capital citizens appeared confused as to why he was referring to a remedy for his pain as a fix, as if he were a machine. Yet as Delaware continued to hold the sleeping bag over his forehead for the next hour, his pain appeared to subside to some degree. One more cannon fired as the blizzard was dying out, which was revealed to be Tybo from Eleven, after being stabbed in a blind encounter with Gunther from Twelve. Lilac correctly observed that this meant they were down to the final eight tributes, a fact which she, Mirai, and Kyan discussed grimly. The rest of the night passed without incident, 
except Kion Jr. nestling himself between Mirai and Lilac, who had been sleeping in rather close proximity to each other. Eugenia and Aeneas debated on whether the pair had been intimate or not, as the darkness in the shelter made it difficult for cameras to see, but Eugenia in particular believed they had. As it began to get dark, Delaware cradled his forehead with the sleeping bag, although the pain of the frostbite was still causing him great distress. He seemed disheartened that a sponsor gift was yet to arrive, but being from a weaker district, it was unlikely that potential sponsors would wish to risk sponsoring one of their gifts on Delaware. However, as midnight began to near, the grimace on his face turned to joy when the ringing of a sponsor gift finally graced his ears. Before the bag had even hit the ground, Delaware snatched it from the air and gleefully opened it to find a small pad that felt warm as he touched one of its sides. He seemed a little perplexed about its function, but when he saw a note that read, Use your head and you can beat this, from M, his idea seemed to be confirmed, and he quickly placed the heated pad over his forehead. Yet as Delaware's pain began to lessen, he realised that there was something left in the bag, which appeared to be a small bottle of morphling. Delaware was shocked as he picked it up and inspected it, realising that it was in fact full of the substance that he so often craved. He quickly looked over at the note once more, Use your head and you can beat this, from M, but then grinned as he appeared to contemplate the second half of this sentence. Eugenia looked on in shock, with Aeneas asking if a mentor had ever sent in Morphling for one of their tributes before, but Eugenia said that she believed that they had not. As they discussed further why Madison Hawker had sent such a harmful gift to her tribute, Delaware held the bottle and got up to stand on the snow that was now blowing around him in the crisp night air. He stared intently at the bottle and opened it, with Eugenia pleading with him not to drink it, whilst Aeneas was saying that he wanted Delaware to do it so that he could see what happened. Yet after a tense few seconds, Delaware suddenly closed his eyes and poured the contents of the bottle onto the ground, smiling as he heard the liquid hitting the snow. He let out a few tears, before throwing the empty bottle as far as he could and then beginning to chuckle, saying that I've been brought this close to death to appreciate my life. Delaware continued to look up at the stars in the night sky, and a smile gradually appeared on his face. He then proceeded to lie down in his sleeping bag once more, and let out a relieved expression as he covered his head with the heat pad. Delaware soon began to fall asleep, and Horn of Plenty played as the portraits of Hathor from five, Gazar and Twill both from eight, and Dionysia from eleven were shown, which left Cayenne and Mirai both from one, Lucretius from two, Carell and Claire both from three, Delaware from six, Lilac from seven, and Gunther from twelve remaining. On the morning of the fourth day, Kyan, Mirai, and Lilac decided to head closer to the cornucopia, hoping that they might be able to encounter and ambush Lucretius. Lilac and Mirai decided to pack up their campsite, while Kyan and Kyan Jr. decided to try some sliding around on the lake. As the two girls were rolling up the sleeping bags and collecting their food, they heard a cry of alarm from the lake and whirled around. Kyan Jr. was honking in agitation as the girls saw that Kyan had accidentally broken the surface of the ice and fallen through, now struggling to stay afloat in the lake. Mirai cried out in alarm but stood rooted to the spot, sensing the danger of attempting to rescue him herself. However, Lilac did not even hesitate for a moment and plunged forward, sliding herself on her stomach across the ice and reaching down to help Kyan. Lilac then pulled him up to safety after a brief struggle, but in the process, the ice under her body gave way due to the pressure she was exerting. Just as Kyan was successfully able to stand up on the ice, Lilac fell in, amid a chorus of distressed honks by Kyan Jr. She struggled to pull herself up onto the ice, but with some help from Kyan, was able to clamber onto her knees. At that very moment, an ice pit came whistling out of nowhere and embedded itself in Lilac's brain, causing her to fall back in the water. Mirai screamed, the first time this had happened since the start of the games, and frantically whirled around. Gunther, from twelve, was hiding behind a sand dune, holding another ice pick in his hand. Mirai started to pursue him as he fled, realising she also had a weapon, but she was quickly called back by Kyan as Gunther escaped unharmed. Kyan had pulled Lilac's limp body up to safety. She lay on the ice, appearing quite serene with her eyes closed, despite the growing puddle of blood surrounding her head and neck. Mirai wept profoundly, and the pair from District 1 held Lilac's hands as her cannons sounded in the distance. Kyan performed the grim task of removing and cleaning the ice pick that Gunther had fired into Lilac's head, as a hovercraft appeared to collect her body. The pair from one had no choice but to finish packing, 
although Mirai's hands were shaking considerably as they did so, and she appeared unstable for the first time since the start of the games. It was also at this point that they said their goodbyes to Kyan Jr., who was not adapted to the sandy environment in the Cornucopia area, and would not be able to travel any more with them. As for Delaware, he spent most of the morning sleeping, and was in fact the last to awaken, shortly after Lilac Cannon sounded. He immediately removed the heat pad from his forehead, and although he had no mirror to check how it looked, he ran his hands along the skin and seemed delighted to feel its smoothness. He then whispered thank you to the sky. However, as Delaware looked around, he appeared to notice that the thick snow which fell the day before had melted, to such an extent that the sand below was more visible, and there were now even gaps in the snow that he had spread over his sleeping bag, which could potentially give his position away if another tribute came near enough. Delaware therefore took his supplies and sleeping bag before stuffing them into his feast bag. He then looked around and appeared to examine the perimeter that lay further southeast, but after seeming to realise that he and the other tributes might soon be called back to the cornucopia for whatever reason, he headed northwest, towards the centre of the arena. After a few minutes, Delaware was elated to receive another sponsor gift. As he continued walking, he opened it, to find that it was a sticky light brown paint, which matched the colour of the sand, that was becoming more prevalent as he neared the centre of the arena. Delaware thanked the sky, but soon stopped walking, before applying the paint all over his visible skin, and then the front section of his white clothing, until he was almost completely light brown on his front half, and white on his back half. Delaware continued walking forwards for another few minutes, often looking around and appearing ready to throw himself onto his back at any time. Yet after almost ten minutes, he had arrived at a spot that lay just a few hundred metres to the southeast of the cornucopia, and so he decided to lay there, before settling himself into the sand, so that nobody could see him. Kayan and Mirai resettled themselves behind a large brigade of rocks that were a few hundred metres from the cornucopia, figuring they would have a front seat to any action should other tributes cross paths. Mirai was extremely upset about the loss of Lilac, and although Kayan comforted her, he promised in a surprisingly mature move that they would continue to remain allies until the end. The tributes maintained a lookout for most of the afternoon, although no one approached the cornucopia area. A few hours later, there was an announcement, this time declaring a feast to commence immediately. Backpacks from districts 1, 2, 3, 6, and 12 appeared on a table that rose up near the cornucopia, containing one thing that each of the remaining seven tributes needed the most. Kayan and Mirai consulted with each other, and agreed they would both attend the feast to cover each other from enemy tributes. As they watched, eyeing an opening, Karel and Claire, both from three, appeared from behind another rock cluster, and seized their bags, although their joy was short-lived. Lucretia showed up as well, slightly winded from having run a great distance in a short period of time, and his face was seen darkening, as he witnessed the gleeful threes about to make off with their bags. Lucretius charged at them from behind, and due to his massive size, he was able to physically grab the two smaller tributes amid their cries of horror. Lucretius then smashed their skulls against each other with a sickening crunch, several times in a row, until two cannons sounded. Gunther, from Twelve, quickly took this opportunity to dart into the cornucopia area, and weave around Lucretius and the pair from District 3. At this time, Mirai hissed under her breath to Kyan that she was no longer able to wait and wished to attend the feast, if only to kill Gunther. Armed with their ice picks, Kyan had no choice as he was dragged by the irate Mirai towards the centre of the cornucopia clearing. Lucretius had finished with the tributes from three, and was looking around for his next target, trying to decide between Gunther and the approaching pair from one. Kyan nodded bravely and wordlessly to his partner as the pair split. Mirai pursued and tackled the retreating Gunther from behind, furiously stabbing him through the head multiple times, and screaming that this was justice for how he killed Lilac. His cannon sounded only seconds later, and Mirai slowly stood back up, breathing heavily. Kyan boldly took on Lucretius, and the pair were locked in an evenly matched struggle, feet digging in the sand for leverage. Throughout all of this, Delaware had managed to slip undetected between the battling tributes, swiped his bag, and fled. Mirai frantically scooped the District's one and two bags into her arms, and stashed them in her jacket in a panic, trying to hurry so she could help Kyan. Kyan and Lucretius continued struggling, perspiring heavily, until Lucretius finally managed to push Kyan backwards against a tall rock in the clearing. Mirai scrambled around, only to realise her ice pick had been lodged in Gunther's head when he was picked up by the hovercraft, 
and that she was weaponless and helpless to whatever could happen next. Lucretius had his pick raised at Cayenne's face, who was restraining it with a shaking arm, and even in the midst of a death match, Cayenne was able to ask Lucretius, Please don't go over the face! It's my best feature! The pair continued her struggle in a strained manner, until eventually Cayenne closed his eyes in acceptance and nodded to Mirai, telling her he wished her the best of luck and to take care of his family if she got home. Cayenne relaxed his grip on Lucretius, just as the ice pick stabbed through his heart. Mirai sprinted back to their rock shelter as quickly as possible, hearing Cayenne's cannon only moments later, and cameras observed that she was swiping at her eyes as she ran. Lucretius had been too focused on killing Cayenne to see where Delaware or Mirai had gone, and he ended up heading to a different corner of the arena without his bag. Now on her own, Mirai opened the three bags she had retrieved, realising too late that Gunther had also taken his bag with him when he died. In the District 2 bag was frostbite medication, which was not useful since she did not have frostbite, but she appeared pleased at her district bags. Cayenne's contained binoculars, and hers contained a matched set of butterfly swords, identical to those which she had at home. Mirai audibly gasped at this second gift, and appeared delighted to have it, thanking the sponsor who had sent the gift, before spending the rest of the evening resting. As for Delaware, he had quickly escaped the feast, whilst checking his feast bag as he ran, to see that it contained a bottle of water which he was visibly pleased with, due to his last bottle having been almost finished the night before. Once he had run a few hundred metres and was certain that no other tribute could see him, he lay on his back again, with his ice pick firmly in his right hand, until he was nicely camouflaged within the sand that lay beneath him. Remarkably, Delaware managed to remain in this position for the next eight hours, only briefly getting up in order to urinate, before lying back down on his back in the exact same position. His eyes began to close shortly before midnight, but he managed to stay awake for just about long enough to hear Horn of Plenty, as the portraits of Cayenne from 1, Carell and Claire both from 3, and Gunther from 12 were shown in the sky, which left only Mirai from 1, Lucretius from 2, and Delaware from 6 remaining. However, the next morning, all three tributes were awakened by an announcement that their trackers would explode if they did not return to the cornucopia within 10 minutes. Considering her camp was not too far from the cornucopia, Mirai spent the time peeking around the edge of the rocks, waiting for the other tributes to show up. As for Delaware, he quickly scrambled to his feet and ran towards the cornucopia, before becoming the first to arrive in the clearing. Mirai did not seem eager to kill Delaware, and she scanned the horizon with the binoculars for Lucretius, before cautiously approaching the cornucopia clearing and seeing Delaware. Mirai asked if they could ally and attempt to fight Lucretius together. Delaware hesitated, but nodded in agreement, and as he readied his ice pick, Mirai withdrew her butterfly swords. The pair waited behind a rock as Lucretius approached the area very carefully, head whipping around for any sign of the others. At once, Mirai and Delaware nodded at each other and charged, attacking Lucretius with their respective weapons. Lucretius was taken aback by this, but was able to backhand Delaware into the nearest rock, thereby knocking the wind out of him. Mirai stabbed forward with her new swords, but Lucretius was too quick and pinned her up against a rock as he had done with Cayenne, placing her in a chokehold. At this moment, something peculiar appeared to occur in Mirai, and what happened next was a moment that would later be dissected many times on Capital TV. Her body tensed, and she lowered her chin. In a flash, she drew Lucretius in, and simultaneously kicked and punched upward, kneeing Lucretius in the groin while punching him squarely in the nose. Eugenia later identified this motion as a common martial arts move to throw off an attacker. By this point, as Lucretius's nose spurted blood and he recovered from the surprise of the attack, Delaware was able to toss a pile of sand from the ground into his eyes. Lucretius staggered backwards in alarm and scrabbled for his ice pick, which he had dropped when Mirai pushed him off her. Delaware and Mirai seized this opportunity to attack him one final time, as Mirai leapt onto him and pinned him to the ground. Delaware sprang into action and quickly slipped his ice pick across Lucretius' throat, which caused Mirai to jump back as she got ready to defend herself. Lucretius' cannons sounded instantly, rendering Delaware and Mirai the final two for this year. Aeneas noted that both were a rather sorry sight, due to coughing from the sand and their respective injuries from the now dead Lucretius. Delaware turned to a wheezing Mirai, appearing apologetic as he realised what he had to do, and hurled his ice pick at her as quickly as he could. Mirai yelped in alarm as it pinned her in the shoulder, and frantically tried to remove it. 
Delaware rushed at her in a vain attempt to remove the pick from her shoulder, but she threw herself to the left at the last second. It was at this moment that she lunged forward and stabbed both of her swords into Delaware's chest, whilst crying out from the pain in her shoulder. Delaware fell to the ground, wheezing, and Mirai groaned in pain again as she stabbed her swords down into his chest, apologising and sadly ruffling his hair as he died. Mirai was heard saying that she wished she could have gotten to know him outside the arena, as he seemed like a nice guy. As Delaware's cannon sounded, Gamemaker Fling announced that Mirai Kobayashi of District 1 was the victor of the 94th Hunger Games. Mirai immediately crumpled to the ground before being airlifted to safety. Viewers could see a few faint tears running down her face, and as the hovercraft left the arena, Eugenia and Ennius debated whether they were from emotional or physical pain. For the victor's interview, Eugenia sported a white, orange and yellow dress with a black tailcoat, in an apparent imitation of the penguins in the arena. Mirai's shoulder had been healed by capital doctors, and the ice pick safely extracted in the time since the games, and she arrived to her interview in a soft, pale purple dress. Throughout her interview, Mirai appeared thoughtful and composed, although rather sad. Eugenia complimented her dress, and asked if it was a tribute to Lilac, to which Mirai responded it was, and that she would not forget Lilac and her sacrifice for a long time to come. She was also asked what she would do with the money and fame now that she was a victor, and Mirai replied that she would do as she said during the games, and open a self-defence training centre in the district to help citizens and models learn to protect themselves in situations of harassment, although she also planned to give half her winnings to Kyan Jones' father and sister. Lastly, Eugenia asked what the capital should do with Kyan Jr., and Mirai declared that he'd be given a good life with plenty of fish and a pretty girl penguin to keep him company. As the interview was concluded, Mirai thanked her mentor, Estelle, and said that she was glad to have made her proud after so many years of disappointments. She also stated she hoped to see the revival of District 1's fighting spirit after this year, and encouraged future District 1 tributes to try new things and not give up. At the end of her interview, Mirai stated that she had tried to be economical throughout the games, not killing unless she saw an opportunity to further her own chances of winning, and that she hoped audiences would appreciate or at least understand her approach. She then ended the interview by curtsying politely to the crowd, and thanking Eugenia for her time. Mirai returned to District 1, and reportedly spent most of her time visiting the Jones family, teaching classes at the new Kobayashi Self-Defense Center, and continuing to model for her family's jewellery line, before taking over the business several years after her victory. She never married, but it is rumoured that several years later, she was romantically involved with Kyan Jones' younger sister, Heliodora. She also continued to be a good friend to Estelle Van Roosh Harrington, and the pair would sometimes teach self-defence classes together, which were always overbooked. It was often said that Mirai wore, and never removed, a necklace with a lilac flower pendant. <laughs>